Okay. Thus have I heard on one occasion the blessed ones living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove and Athen Pandika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, monks, venerable sir, they replied, the blessed one said this. Monks, for the most part, beings... Oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Maybe we need to turn it up. Let's turn it up here and see what happens. Testing, 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 that's a little better. <clears throat> For the most part, beings have this wish, desire, and longing. If only unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things would diminish, and wished for desired agreeable things would increase. That sounds reasonable, yeah? Even though all beings have this wish, desire, and longing, unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things increase for them, and wished for desired agreeable things diminish. Now, monks, what do you think is the reason for that? Venerable Sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One, have the Blessed One as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Then listen, monks, and attend closely to what I shall say. That's really an important part. Be attentive. Don't let your mind wander. Don't be looking around and just not paying attention as closely as you can. Yes, venerable sir, the Blessed One said this. Here, monks, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for the noble ones, is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for true men, and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma. These are the monks that they do the study, and they're, they're very well versed in what the Buddha is talking about. But they don't have a practice. Or they're practicing very little. Does not know what these things should be cultivated and what things should not be cultivated. He does not know what things should be followed and what things should not be followed. Not knowing this, he cultivates things that should, should not be cultivated and does not cultivate things that should be cultivated. He follows things that should not be followed and does not follow things that should be followed. Because he does this, that unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things increase for him and wished for, desired, agreeable things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who does not see clearly. <clears throat> the well-taught noble disciple whose regard for noble ones is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma who has regard for true men, is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, knows what things should be cultivated and what things should not be cultivated. He knows what things should be followed and what things should not be followed. Knowing this, he cultivates things that should, should be followed and cultivated.
and does not cultivate things that should not be cultivated. He follows things that should be followed and does not follow things that should not be followed. It is because he does this that unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things diminish for him and wished for, desired, agreeable things increase. Why is that? That is what happens to one who knows and sees clearly. Monks, there are these four ways of undertaking things. What are the four? There is a way of undertaking things that is painful right now and ripens in the future as pain. There is a way of undertaking things that is pleasant right now and ripens in the future as pain. There is a way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. There, are, there is a way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future is pleasant. Now there's another sutta in uh, Digha Nikaya that talks about this. It's talking directly about meditation. There are some meditations that are real painful at the start and they're always painful. What is that? Well, breaking your precepts is painful now because you feel guilty and is painful in the future because it disturbs your mind. Now, monks, one who is ignorant, that doesn't mean stupid. That means just not educated. You don't understand. You don't know. Not knowing this way of undertaking things is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. Does not understand as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. Not knowing it, not understanding it as it actually is, the ignorant one cultivates it and does not avoid it. Because he does so, unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things increase in him and wished for, desired, agreeable things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who does not know and see clearly makes sense. Now, monk, one who is ignorant, not knowing this way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain, does not understand as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is pleasant now and ripes in the, fu in the future as pain not knowing, not understanding as it actually is. The ignorant one cultivates it and does not avoid, does not avoid it. Ah, that helps. Because he does so, unwished for, things increase for him, and wished for things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who does not know and see clearly. Now, monks, one who is ignorant, not knowing the way of undertaking things, that is painful now, ripens in the future as pleasure, does not understand as it actually is. 
Thus, this way of undertaking things is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. Not knowing it, not understanding it as it actually is, the ignorant one does not cultivate it, but avoids it. Because he does so, the unwished for things increase for him and the wished for things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens who, to one who does not know and see. What is that? Well, it's pleasurable to drink alcohol, right? But what happens when you drink too much? <laughs> Pain. Now, monks, one who is ignorant, not knowing the way of undertaking things, that is pleasant now, ripens in the future as pleasure. What is that? Give me a guess. What's pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasant? Starts with a six. <laughs> ah, okay. Does not understand it as it actually is thus. The way of undertaking things is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Not knowing it and not understanding it, it is actually the ignorant one who does not cultivate it well, I guess that's going to be the last one, not this one for the six Rs. But avoids, avoids it because he does so. Unwished for things increase for him and wished for things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who knows and sees clearly. Now, monks, one who is wise, knowing this way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain, understands as it actually is thus. This undesirable things is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. Knowing it, understanding it as it actually is, the wise one does not cultivate it, but avoids it because he does so. Unwished for the undesired disagreeable things diminish for him and wished for desirable things increase. Why is that? That is what happens to one who knows and sees clearly. Now, monks, one who is wise, knowing this way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain, understands it as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is pleasant now and ripens in the future as, pleasant, as, as pain. Knowing it, understanding it as it actually is, the wise one does not cultivate it, but avoids it. Because he does so, wished for things diminish for him and wished for things increase. Why is that? That is what happens to one who knows and sees. Now, monks, one who is wise, knowing and seeing this way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure, understands as it actually is. This way of undertaking things is painful now and ripens in the future as pain, pleasure. Knowing it, understanding it as it actually is, the wise one does not avoid it, but cultivates it. Because he does so, unwished for things diminish for him and wished for things increase. Why is that? 
That is what happens to one who knows and sees clearly. Now, monks, one who is wise, knowing this way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure, understands it as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is now pleasant and ripens in the future as pleasure. What's coming to my mind right now is one-pointed concentration because it's pleasure, pleasurable, you have a lot of bliss, you're in that bliss and afterwards you feel really good. But that's not leading to the end of the suffering. Knowing it, understanding it as it actually is, the wise one does not avoid it, but cultivates it. Because he does so, unwished for things diminish for him, and wished for things increase. Why is that? That's what happened to one who knows and sees clearly. What monk is the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. Here, monks, someone in pain and grief kills living beings. And he experienced pain and grief after that killing of living beings as condition. In pain and grief, he takes what is not given. He misconducts himself in sexual pleasures. He speaks falsehoods. He speaks maliciously. He speaks harshly. He gossips and is covetous, covetous. Has a mind of ill will holds wrong view and experiences pain and grief that have wrong view as condition. So on the desolation of the body after death, he reappear, reappears in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. That gives you some idea what happens when you break the precepts, doesn't it? These things are real. And it's your responsibility. Even the slightest little white lie can cause this kind of problem for you. This is called the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. What monks is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain. <clears throat> Here monks, Someone in pleasure and joy kills living beings. And he experiences pleasure and joy that have killing living beings as their condition. In pleasure and joy, he takes what is not given. I ran across a man, that he got caught, but he uh, robbed someplace. And he said, when he opened up that safe, oh, he was so happy. But one of the things that happens with things that you steal is they don't last. They just disappear on their own. So it's only a short period of time and then you're broke again. So, and he experiences pleasure and joy that have wrong view as condition. On the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation, 
an unhappy destination in perdition, even in hell. This is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future is pain. What monks is the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Here, someone in pain and grief abstains from killing living beings. And he experiences pain and grief that have abstention from killing living beings as their condition. In pain and grief, he abstains from taking what is not given. He abstains from sexual misconduct. Sexual misconduct is much understood. That doesn't mean abstinence from sexual conduct. I mean, there's too many Buddhists in the world to believe that. It means having wrong sexual activity with someone that's too young wrong sexual acti activity with another person's partner. And the guilty feeling that happens along with that. Any kind of sexual activity that causes pain and dissatisfaction to arise, that's wrong sexual activity. Now, a lot of monks, they, they refuse to talk about this kind of thing. And it's something that you need to know so that you won't do that sort of thing. Okay. From speaking of falsehood, from speaking maliciously, from speaking harshly, this is another one that's it's really catching on right now with um, uh, all societies. That's foul language. What kind of a mind do you have when you're cursing? Is it happy and uplifted? No. Why? Because you feel guilty for saying it and you upset other people. So you don't want to be doing that sort of thing. From gossiping, what is gossip? It's talking about somebody that's not there and talking, making up stories about them. And basically telling lies. And I know that it's a big temptation. And what you wanna do is picture that person standing right beside you and whatever you say, they hear what you're saying. And that will stop you from gossiping and making up stories about how bad they are in one way or another. He is not covetous. He doesn't try to become jealous of other people. He does not have a mind of ill will. He holds right view. He experiences pain and grief that have right view as condition. On the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. This is called the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. What monks is a way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future is pleasant. Now we got the six R's. Here monks, someone in pleasure and joy abstains from killing living beings and he experiences pleasure and joy that have abstention from killing living beings as a condition. One of the things that's real interesting is 
There's an awful lot of beings, they're pets, that you think you're saving them from painful existence by taking them to the vet and have what they call putting them to sleep. That's just another way of saying they're murdering them. The thing is, if you're with that being and they're in a lot of pain, they take comfort in knowing that you love them. And even though their body has pain, their mind has a tendency to be more uplifted. And there were some that uh, people left for roadkill and I would take them and try to take them to the vet to see if we could fix it. And the vet said, well, we might as well put them to sleep. I said, no, no way. I'll take them home. And I would uh, chant for them the, the Metta Sutta. And I would chat, chant to them the blessings and all kinds of kind things. You know, Animals know more about your mind state than you think they do. And when they feel that loving kindness coming to them, that makes their mind settle down and they accept the fact that they're going to die. Oh, I spent a lot of time, about a year, being with people as they die. I was working in a nursing home. And there were some people that had extreme pain. Uh, one lady in particular that I can remember, she had cancer in her brain and she was always in a state of pain. But I was lucky enough, and not pe many people would think that was lucky, but I was lucky enough to be with her and I gave her the precepts she wasn't conscious at the time, but she understood what I was doing and she was feeling that love coming from me. And she actually died smiling. That made me happy. Of course, the family suffers a lot and it's, I'm not happy because of that but I was happy for them because their mind was uplifted. And you could, I could almost feel them being taken to a pleasant realm. In pleasure and joy abstains from taking what is not given. When somebody drops their wallet, and you can go run after them and say, here, you dropped this. What does that do to their mind? Yeah. Now, another thing that happens is if you broke a precept and you feel guilty about it, then go buy an animal that's going to be killed. Take them away and let them go free. And I've done this a few times, mostly because I wanted to be an example for other people. And they would see that, that it was with chickens. They're not known to be the smartest animals in the world. And they turn around, look me straight in the eye, thanking me. Now what happens at the butcher? The chicken gets pulled out, they kill it, they take the feathers off, they give it to the person that's buying it. But this time, they get grabbed and they, they, they see what's happening to the other animals 
and oh man, it's my time. And they're really afraid. They're truly afraid. So the butcher takes them and ties their feet up and they go, well, uh, I guess they're going to kill me later. So they still have the fear of death. But I would take them out to the forest and cut the strings and let them go free. And they always would go a little ways away, turn around and look me in the eye and thank me. Because they went from the worst day in their life to the best day. And people would say, well, if you do this with fish, and they'll do the same thing, they'll still look you in the eye and, and then go swim off. And they, people say, well, they're going to get caught and, and killed. That's their karma. That's not, doesn't have anything to do with me. It's okay. So you let them go free. And they're real thankful. And when you let them go free, you let them go free with the thought of giving up that guilty feeling of having done that to other animals. Or done some... Um, some deed, you've broken a precept in one way or another. And that's one of the highest gifts you can give. Giving life is really amazing. So if, if you feel like you've uh, had some kind of guilty feeling about something. It doesn't matter how long ago. It doesn't matter even if it's in another lifetime. You're still carrying around that guilty feeling. So what you want to do is let these animals go free with that guilty feeling. And you will feel immediate joy and happiness for doing it. And it's really amazing. There was one place that I, I was in Malaysia at the time, and they have a lot of hunting birds, hawks and eagles and that sort of thing. And I let this chicken go. I let two of them go, actually. And they were real clever, and they would go hide under something when the birds were flying around looking for food. And they lasted a long time. And I, I came back maybe a year later and I was shocked. These chickens came running up to me and, and saying hi, basically. And they lived a fairly long life, I guess. I didn't go back after that, but I was truly amazed that that happened. Anyway, he holds right view. What is right view? Letting go of grieving. That's how you purify your mind. Using the six R's. And he experiences pleasure and joy that have right view as condition. Well, you know that for a fact because you've all felt it. That's wonderful. On the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even a heavenly realm. This is the, the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasant because you have the memory of helping them. It made a lot of joy come up in, in me when I saw the chickens. That was really amazing. I, I was quite happy for a lot of days after that. And the thing is, the more happy you become, the less you have pain in your body. So it's, it's a good thing all the way around and lasts for a long time. Yeah. About guilt by association, like you take on other people's 
How can you take on somebody else's breaking a precept? You can't. All you can do is be a support for them and radiate loving kindness to them. And you can tell them it's a good thing if they find an animal. The bigger the animal, the better. A pig is another real good one. You let them... Uh, people don't like it much if you let them go free, but you can keep them around and feed them until they die. I, I had a pig that he weighed about 200 pounds. He was about 250 pounds when he, when he left. And they're one of the best pets you've ever run across. They're smart. They have a sense of humor. They laugh with you. They don't smell bad, especially if you don't hold them in a small place. You put them in a, in a field and they can run around and do whatever they want. And I had a pig, he followed me wherever I went and he even developed a way of getting into the back of my truck. And I didn't know he was there until I looked in the rearview mirror and there's a pig with his ears flapping. But he had a lot of joy in doing that and he, he paid attention to what I was saying quite a bit. They say that pigs have the mentality of about a seven-year-old, so they do understand what you're saying. I read this thing in uh, a newspaper about this one guy that he had a pig in his house. It was a pet. And the pig did something that the owner didn't like. So the owner said, you know, I'm going to turn you into bacon. <laughs> And this is when they had uh, wires on the telephone. He went and pulled the telephone down on the ground. With his nose, he dialed 911 and then squeals. <laughs> I thought that was just great. But they have a sense of humor and they're always doing things. And in the spring, I was living in a place that had a fairly big garden and I would dig down a, a little ways and I would put a lump of cheese that was moldy and really gunky and put it in and cover it up. Then springtime came and I said, okay, you got to go to work. And he would dig up my garden for me so I didn't have to do it. It worked. It was a good relationship. But he was always doing things to step in the way and I'd fall down or whatever. He was always playing jokes like that. <clears throat> so, Samo, so, uh, I love this part. I absolutely love it. If you've ever had bitter gourd, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Monks suppose there were a bitter gourd mixed with poison and a man who came who wanted to live, not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain, who told him, good man, this bitter gourd is mixed with poison. Drink from it. They can juice it. And as you drink from it, its color, its smell, and its taste will not be agreeable for you. And that's the understatement of the year. <laughs> <laughs> but the Asians love it. They can eat, they, they, they'll eat anything, as, as even the foulest stuff. And they do it as medicine. So they can have these all these medicines that are really bad tasting, but their body heals because of it. So the best thing that Western medicine has come up with in all of medicine is the little tab you can put that foul tasting stuff in so you can get it down without tasting it. 
Anyway, that's my personal opinion. After drinking it, you will come to death or deadly suffering. Then he drank it without reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, its smell, and its taste did not agree with him. And after drinking from it, he came to death or deadly suffering. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. Suppose there was a bronze cup of beverage possessing a good color, a smell and taste that was nice. But it was mixed with poison and a man who came who wanted to live, not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain, told him, good man, this bronze cup, very nice to look at, possesses a good, a good color and a nice smell, and it has a good taste, but it's mixed with poison. Drink from it if you want. As you drink from it, its color, smell, and taste will agree with you, but after drinking it, you will come to death or deadly suffering. Then he drank from it without reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, smell, and taste agreed with him. It was pleasurable. But his drinking from it, he came to death or deadly suffering. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain. Suppose there were fermented urine mixed with various medicines and a man came sick and with jaundice and they told him, good man, this fermented urine is mixed with various medicines. Drink from it if you want. As you drink from it, its color, smell, and taste will not agree with you. But after drinking from it, you will be well. Now, this sounds really weird, but in Vinaya, there is a remedy for a lot of skin problems. They have, uh, well, just a lot of things that make you itch and that sort of thing. And the remedy is to go out and get a quart of cow's urine and let it sit in the sun for uh, a few days. And then you drink it. Now the color is nice. There's no taste to it. It's not bitter. There's no taste. But after you drink it, it makes your body smell really bad. I mean, it, it's foul. And after a couple of days of doing that, you're, you're over your skin problem, but you don't have any friends coming around. <laughs> So you have to suffer with that. <laughs> then he drank it after reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, <coughs> its color, taste, and smell did not agree with him. But after drinking from it, he became well. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that's painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Suppose there were curd, honey, ghee, and molasses mixed together. And a man with dysentery came, and he told him, good man, this curd, honey, ghee, and molasses mixed together 
drink it if you want. As you drink it, its color, smell, and taste will agree with you. And after drinking it, you'll get well. Then he drank from the, re and after reflecting, and did not relinquish it. As he drank from its color, its smell, and its taste agreed with him. After drinking from it, he became well. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking that which is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure. <clears throat> when one comes to know this, he investigates him further thus. Are there found in, in the Tathagata or not clean states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? When he investigates, he comes to know clean states recognizable through the eye or the nose are found in the Tathagata. When he comes to know this, he investigates him further. Has this venerable one attained any this wholesome state over a long time, or did he attain it recently? When he investigates him, he comes to know the venerable one has attained this wholesome state over a long time. He did not attain it only recently. Now, this is something that happens for a lot of folks. They, they really are enthusiastic. They want it to happen as fast as it can. But my teacher, Usila Nanda, he knew I was the kind of a person that really didn't want to wait. I wanted it now. And he told me about every day, patience leads to Nibbana. So remember that statement for yourself. If, you, if you're impatient, you try too hard. If you try too hard, you have more restlessness. If you have more restlessness, you have more pain in your head and in your body. So relax into things. Don't resist or push. Soften. Smile. Okay? Remember that. When he comes to know this, he investigates him further. Thus, has this venerable one acquired renown and attained fame? so that the danger is connected with renown and fame. That's pride. I'm something special. Are found in him. For monks, as long as a monk has thus not acquired renown and fame, the dangers connected with that renown and fame are not found in him. But when he has acquired renown and fame, those dangers are found. When he investigates him, he comes to know this venerable one has acquired renown and fame. But the dangers connected with renown and fame are not found in him. And that's one of the things that it was always a danger for me especially being in Asia, because I was so much bigger than anybody else. They always looked up to me, because they had to, because they were short. <laughs> but <clears throat> they also listened to what I was saying, for the most part. And they, uh, when I went to, I was invited to go to the biggest monastery in Malaysia, that was Theravada, and I was asked to give Dhamma talks every other week on Friday nights. Okay, fair enough. 
When the head monk, K. Sri Dhammananda, a very famous monk, he wrote 60 or 70 books. He was very famous. He introduced me. <clears throat> While there was a couple thousand people watching a ceremony that we did at the start of the range retreat. And the head monk says, we're very, very lucky to have this famous monk be with us for the whole range retreat. You should take advantage of it. So I'm sitting right beside him and I'm thinking, I wonder who he's talking about. <laughs> I started looking down the way and I turn back to the head monk and he's handing me the microphone. I was the famous monk. I didn't know I was famous. And then he says, oh, just give a talk for an hour and a half. That'll be long enough. Oh, geez, not prepared at all. So I fumbled my way through it. But it was really a shock to me to find out that he considered me famous. Anyway, when he comes to know this, he investigates him further thus, if a venerable one is restrained with fear, not restrained with, he's restrained without fear, not restrained with fear. And he does, avoid indulging in sensual pleasures because he's without lust through the destruction of lust. When he investigates him, he comes to know this venerable one is restrained without fear, not restrained by fear. And he avoids indulging in sensual pleasures because without lust, through the destruction of lust. Now, monks, if others should ask that monk thus, what are the venerable one's reasons and what is his evidence whereby he says the venerable one is restrained without fear, not restrained by fear? and avoids indulging in sensual pleasures because he's without lust through the destruction of lust. Answering rightly, that monk would answer thus, whether that venerable one dwells in the Sangha or alone, while some, while some there are well-behaved and some are ill-behaved, and some teach a group. While some are seen uh, concerned about material things and some are unsullied by material things, still that venerable one does not despise anyone because of that. And I have heard and learn from the Blessed One from his own lips. I am not restrained. I am restrained without fear, not restrained by fear. I avoid indulging in sensual pleasures because I am without lust through the destruction of lust. The Tathagata monks should be questioned further about this. Are there found in the Tathagata or not any defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? The Tathagata would answer thus, no defiled states cognizable through the eye or the ear are found in the Tathagata. If asked, are there found in the Tathagata not any mixed states cognizable through the eye or the ear? 
<clears throat> the Tathagata would answer thus, no mixed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. If asked, are there found in the Tathagata or not, cleanse states cognizable through the eye and through the ear. The Tathagata would answer thus, cleanse states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. They are my pathway, my domain, yet I do not identify with them. He has no craving. Monks, a disciple should approach the teacher who speaks thus in order to hear the Dhamma. The teacher teaches him in the Dhamma with its higher and higher levels, with its more and more sublime levels, with its dark and bright counterparts. As the teacher teaches the Dhamma to a monk, in this way, through direct knowledge of a certain teaching, here in that Dhamma, the monk comes to a conclusion about the teachings. He places confidence in the teacher thus. The Blessed One is fully awakened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha is practicing the good way. Now, if others should ask that monk thus, what are the venerable one's reasons? What is his evidence whereby he says the blessed one is fully awakened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the blessed one, the Sangha is practicing the good way? Answering rightly, that monk would answer, here, friends, I approach the Blessed One in order to hear the Dhamma. The Blessed One taught me the Dhamma with its higher and higher levels, with its more and more sublime levels, with its dark and bright counterparts. As the Blessed One taught the Dhamma in me in this way, through direct knowledge, of a certain teaching here in the Dhamma, I came to know and reached the conclusion about the teachings. I placed confidence in the teacher. The Blessed One is fully awakened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha is practicing the good way. Monks, when anyone's faith is thus planted, rooted, and established in the Tathagata, through these reasons, terms, and phrases, his faith is said to be supported by reasons, rooted in vision, seeing directly, and very firm. It is invisible by any recluse or Brahmin for our God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world. That is how the monks, there is an investigation of the Dhamma in accordance with the Dhamma. And that is how the Tathagata is well investigated in accordance with the Dhamma. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now it's real interesting. A lot of people, they don't like the idea of taking the precepts every day. Oh, it's just a rite and ritual. No, it's not. It is reminding you that you want to keep them without breaking them. Why? Because that leads to your well-being. That leads to a magical kind of life. 
you can think some happy thing from about somebody else, and it just emanates from you. It's a real fun. So the more you can do this, the more your mind becomes uplifted. And that's why I wrote the book with the title, Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life. Meditation is not about sitting. It's about practice, all the time, whatever you're doing. Develop your mindfulness so you can see unwholesome state starts to arise and you can 6R right then. It's real fun. So the more you don't take this as some kind of commandment and some god is going to throw a thunderbolt at you, uh, the more you take this seriously, but happily, the more uplifted you become. You can, uh, you can become a sotapanna by not practicing meditation at all. But having faith that the Buddha's teaching is the right way and hearing a Dhamma talk, all of a sudden it can click. And there you are. I haven't had many students that that's happened to, but there are some. One of them, I was giving her a talk on dependent origination and she was really, really interested in dependent origination. And I told her that it's not this subtle, just moment to moment dependent origination you need to understand. You need to understand in your life. And as soon as I said that, she got it. There it was. And she was happy for days and days after that. She was walking around being joyful and her personality type was, she was fearful of things and she was very unsure of herself. And that just disappeared. I saw her with this magnificent, and it really is a magnificent glow on her face and that made me really happy. Every time one of you experiences Nibbana, it makes me exceptionally happy for the rest of the day. I'll think about that and I'll see your face in my mind and that's, oh, wow. And you hear me say thank you because you've done the work. You've understood how it really occurs. So why wouldn't I say thank you for doing all that hard work that you're doing? It can be fun work, but it's still hard. It's like practicing some kind of instrument. You have fun doing it, but as you get better and better, you start really appreciating it more and having fun doing it. That's the way all life is. And that's what I wish for you. And it's a sincere wish. The more people we have like that in the world, the easier things become. You'll see for yourself. So, please continue on. This is a fun practice, so have fun doing it. Well, I don't know how to have fun. Well, can you laugh? Can you laugh at how crazy your mind can be sometimes? Because it is. We're all crazy. The only people that are not crazy, I've never run across one, is an arahat. But it's, it's worth it looking for them. <laughs> 
So, do you have any questions? Do you really understand what I'm trying to get across? Yeah. You said that <clears throat> if um, for whatever reason we might have killed a living being, right. you know, you could do, you know, remedy, so to speak, right? Right. Get a, a, an animal that's going to like die when you go. Um, is there the same thing that happens, let's say, for, you know, gossip or lying? Yeah. You can let it go by giving life. It's a wonderful practice. I told this to one lady and she did it and she had a couple of kids. One of them was three and or four and the other was five or six. And they went with her to let the animal go and they said, Mom, let's do that again. And they actually, they would go out and get some corn for the animals, for the, the chickens, and feed them. So that was a nice start for their freedom reign, as it were. And they, they did it fairly often. So that was a, a good thing. It's a great thing. It's a great lesson for your kids, because they kind of imitate you. And they see how happy you can become. So it's it's helping now, but it's also helping the future generations. Yeah. Uh, the piece of against lying that counts is about yourself, like lying yeah. to yourself, right? Right. So, uh, it seems like it should. Yeah. I'll try to follow that as closely as you can so you don't do that anymore. Okay? Yeah. Um, this is in regard to um, watching other people suffer yeah. or expressing them. So I'm in the medical business and we see people suffer. And sometimes when they're dying, we uh, put them on drips so they can... <coughs> Don't do that. Refuse to do that. My mother ran a nursing home for 50 years. She helped people a lot. She was one of the most compassionate people I've ever run across. And I worked for her, so she let me do pretty much what I wanted to do with, with people that were dying. Now, there's a couple of books that we have over here. One of them is Who Dies by Stephen Levine. And the other is by Stephen Levine. It's called Healing into Death. And it could give you some real good insights into how to handle that. You can't take somebody else's pain away as much as you want to. Even when you give them drugs, you're not helping them, really. What you need to do is start radiating loving kindness to them. Their mind will settle down. I told quite a few people that if they had family members that they truly loved, to get a picture of them and put in front of your face as you're dying. And they had a tendency to die with smiles. Now, always when I was with them, sometimes a family would come and they don't know me from anybody. So the last thing I would tell them was that I share the merit of every good act that I've ever done in any lifetime. And they would, uh, their mind would start to come up, of course. And I also told them to remember times when they laughed and had fun with their family members. And that helped their mind be uplifted. Now there's different visions that people can have right as they're dying. 
And that's the whole reason I was being around people, because I wanted to see if those visions are real. Yeah, I've read it in the suttas, but I want to know. I want to know firsthand. There are some people that are really grumpy and they have a lot of hatred when they die. They die a horrible death. I mean, they, they die suffering a lot. And they're probably going to be reborn in a hell realm. There was one man that he was, he was really greedy his whole life and that was his habitual tendency. And right as he was dying, he started saying out loud, don't pull me away. And I said, what's happening? He said, well, there's this black hairy beast that's pulling me away. And if I die right now, I'm going to be one of those. So I gave him the precepts and I told him to take it easy. And his mind got uplifted right after that. There is times, uh, the American Indians, they always talk about the happy hunting ground where they can go and kill animals. And uh, they're going to be reborn as an animal that's going to be killed very often. There are some people, and uh, some of my friends that had died, they were very close to death, and they, it was like they were talking to somebody else. I said, who are you talking to? Well, my family members are sitting right here. They've already died, and they're, they're encouraging me to let go so I can be with them. So they're reborn as a human being. And then there's the ones that I work with by keeping the precepts, reciting the precepts. Sometimes I would read from the Bible because they felt comfortable with that. I, I don't care. That's up to them. What their belief is, is fine. I have no problem with that at all. So I would read to them, and as they were dying, they would tell me that well, there's some beings coming down, and this sounds corny, but they come down with a chariot that's motored by itself, it doesn't have white horses on it, and they pick them up and they take them to a heavenly realm. So after being around enough people and seeing this, I really became a believer. Now, the thing with the precepts, if there's nobody around to tell that you broke the precept, what I want you to do is forgive yourself for breaking the precept. Take the precepts, you only have five, it only takes a minute, recite the precepts, and then make a real strong determination, I don't want to do that again, because that causes me pain in the future. I don't want that. And you'll feel relief. So that's how you can purify your mind. Being a monk, I, I do a confession every morning in case I did break something. Not that I absolutely did, but I might have broken a precept not knowingly. There's no excuse. So don't do that. Okay, so I confess it every morning. And there's always a sense of relief when I do that. I did it every day for, for two years while I was in Burma with the monks, and it was like a private little ceremony we went through every day, but this was the kind of ceremony that had some real meaning to it. So it was good to do it. Yeah. Um, my best friend passed away a few months ago. I, I mean, I still talk to him. Okay. Um, and I'm you can really... You... Set that to like, I'm trying to like talk to animals or... 
Well, let me tell you, you can still radiate loving kindness to them, but you're not going to get any effect from it. Right now, I want you to stay with the loving kindness, and um, this is your training period. So they have to be alive. Yeah, yeah, right. But in the future, if you want to bring a picture of them and, and radiate loving kindness to them and wish them happiness and you can donate to the Sangha and you, you see that that happens, um, that can make them very happy. If they were reborn as a hungry ghost, that means their mouth was so small that they can't even take a sip of water. Uh, it will make them so happy that they can leave that realm and become one of the, in, into the heavenly realm, depending on their karma. And it, it's recommended, that's one of the things that the Buddha said to do with your departed relatives, is find monks to give it to, donate to them, with the idea of them getting the merit for doing that, and food will automatically appear in front of them. And if they're in a realm where they can get food, it will make them extremely happy. And they'll walk around singing and dancing and having fun because they feel so good that you've remembered them. It's not no. Why would that be an attachment? Is there any craving in that? No, I mean, uh, Well, that's what I'm talking. The wishing. And making a pet. Making? Is there any attachment in making it? No. Well, then it's a pure gift, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I still watch television. Okay. You know, there, there's a there's a remedy for that. It's called a brick. <laughs> a brick. <laughs> and, uh, and some of the programs, many of the programs that I enjoy, they break the precepts quite often. Yeah. Um, so what's your what's your, what's your find some movies that don't. Right. How does that? How do, I guess. I guess. Uh, I guess. It's just, it's, you're watching unwholesome activity, so therefore that... Right, you have a tendency to break it because they do. Because right. that's what you're putting in front of you. That's one of the uh, folds of the Eightfold Path, is being careful with that sort of thing. And I do too. But... It doesn't really affect me. I don't think about it later. But be careful about the news that you get. Because they're professional liars. <laughs> so, anything else? Okay, let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear-struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they alone protect the Buddha's dispensation. Thank uh, uh, uh.